Hello class and welcome back. Today we're going to go over mixing consoles. So that's chapter four. So again, please make sure you've already read that before you uh, continue the lecture. Well, so let's talk about the different components we're going to find on a typical mixing consoles channel strip. So remember when we talk about consoles, usually it's a combination of channel strips, multiples, uh, and then those are all going to bleed to our master section, which we then can kind of turn up to allow everyone to monitor things of that nature. So let's talk about the individual strips first though. So a typical console is gonna have a strip and that's usually the easiest way to figure out a console is just figure out the strip first because once you've figured out one strip, you technically you now know all the strips, which is pretty cool. So let's talk about what you might find in a typical strip. First off, the preamp. Uh, the preamp is gonna be required to bring our mic level up to that line level. It's where we're gonna increase the amplitude of our signal. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's uh, gonna bring it again from mic level to line level. Uh, we're also gonna find a 48 volt uh, that's sometimes called phantom power. Um, it's usually required for all condenser mics unless the mic happens to have a battery uh, inside, but most condenser mics don't. So most times whenever you do have a condenser mic, in order for it to be supercharged like it needs to be in order to be as sensitive as a condenser mic is, it requires this supercharged power. So it's effectively getting 48 volts from the console supercharging the microphone. So anytime you have a, a condenser mic, you're gonna need that phantom power to be engaged on that mic's channel strip. Next we have mic in line. This is gonna determine uh, if the channel will be used in mic or line input. So most consoles will have two inputs per channel. They'll have a mic input or they'll have a line input. Some of them now actually have what they call combi jacks. So you can actually plug into a single input and then you can select with your pad uh, if you want to be mic or line mode. But in any case, most times it's just selecting which input you're using. Are you going in to the mic input or the line input? Uh, typically the mic input is going to get the full volume of the preamp. If the, the preamp can give up to 60 decibels, you're gonna get all 60 decibels with that mic pre. Uh, typically, whenever you go into the line input though, you're gonna bypass a little bit of that preamp because they've expected that you've already gone through a preamp to get to line level, so there won't be as much gain that you can be given with the, uh, the preamp knob. So that's just something to consider. Uh, usually mic inputs are usually coming from a mic. Uh, line would be something like uh, maybe a keyboard or something that has its own volume control or its own preamp, something that's already at line level. Or even our uh, returns from say Pro Tools where those are already again at line level. Uh, phase flip. So this flips the polarity 180 degrees on the selected channel. It's usually used to fix uh, phase issues. Um, so as an, uh, as an example, uh, let's say we have a microphone on the, the top of a snare and we have another microphone on the bottom of the snare. Um, well, what, what's going to happen there is that this one's going to get uh, positive polarity while this one's getting negative polarity and, and vice versa. So what we do is we'd flip this guy 180 degrees. So that way, even though he's capturing the sound on the bottom of the snare, which is usually much brighter than the nice snap and pop that you get off the top of the snare, but what we'll do is we'll flip them in phase to where they'll react together as far as the push and pull of the speaker. So we can keep the snare in phase with multiple microphones capturing different sources, but we want those the positive push together and the negative pull together. Cool. So pad, we talked about that a little bit. That would be if, let's say, um, we have only a single input for mic and line, and we wanted our signal to be line level instead of mic level, that's usually where that pad will be engaged. It's gonna lower the amplitude of the input at the preamp uh, to line level. Uh, it allows line level signal to be input into a mic level input. So it's usually good for loud sources. So if you only have that mic input and you're, you're already coming from a keyboard that has a preamp, you can engage that line level to where your, your preamp can be just right on your console. Um, next, we've got the reverse flip return. This isn't found on all consoles. You're not going to usually find it on live consoles, but you will find it on nicer uh, studio consoles. It's a, usually an option for inline consoles that it's a button that gives another option besides the fader to send and return a signal. So effectively, it's in an inline console, 
uh, we're going to use one channel to send to Pro Tools, and we use that same channel to return from Pro Tools. So we can use the preamp to get our signal nice and up to line level like we might need to. We can check our meter in Pro Tools, and it's going to return back to that fader that then hits the master section where we can monitor it. And we do that with that reverse flip because without engaging that reverse flip, that preamp is going to make it to that fader, and you're going to hear your fader before Pro Tools. So in order for us to hear it after Pro Tools, we're going to use this reverse flip return. Cool. So uh, beyond the uh, the preamp section on each channel strip, you'll usually find EQ. EQ is pretty standard nowadays to be found on most consoles. Um, it's, and of course, it's going to vary from console to console. Uh, and of course, the parameters uh, can include anything from the Q, amplitude, or frequency. And again, this is just tone control. So we're going to be able to in individually tone control each channel. Let's kind of uh, look a little bit uh, deeper into a uh, the preamp EQ section of a channel strip. Uh, this particular example is our Neve console, which uh, whenever we make our way back to uh, ACC, this is the console that we're going to have in the main control room. So on each channel strip, you know this console's pretty big console. However, if you break it down again into each channel strip, each channel strip is going to have the same preamp section, same EQ section. So this preamp section here, this is where we can select our input. So did we plug into the mic input or the line input? Uh, this is where we've got our preamp. So this is where we're going to increase our gain. If you can see here, we can increase the gain up to 66 decibels. Uh, we've also uh, got a little bit of a trim. So that's just a small uh, booster cut of a 6 decibels. So it's small changes because if you notice, every one of these click ups is a 6 decibel click. So if we wanted to find a sweet spot in the middle of the clicks, we use the trim knob. Um, next thing, uh, if we want to send that signal to the EQ, we engage this button. Then we turn the EQ on. And then from there, we can play with the EQ. We've talked about EQ before. Um, so of course, again, that's just tone control. Cool, so let's uh, continue on down the channel strip uh, beyond the EQ. Uh, that's where we're usually gonna find our pan, solos, and mute. So panning is gonna allow you to place a sound anywhere between the left and right speaker. So we're able to either pan all the way to the left, all the way to the right, or anywhere in between. Solo allows a user to isolate the channel's uh, selection from the others. Uh, however, multiple channels can be soloed at the same time. So if we just wanna hear the vocal, we can solo the vocal. If we wanna hear the uh, both vocals at the same time, we could solo both vocals at the same time. Uh, and mute, uh, of course, that's just going to turn the sound off at the selected channel. So if we've got it muted, uh, we won't be able to hear that channel. Cool. So let's uh, continue our way down just a little bit. Sometimes this is going to be located above the faders between the EQ and, and the faders uh, is what we call our auxiliary section. This is used typically to create separate mixes. That could be headphone mixes, it could be uh, signals that need to be sent to our effect chains, uh, signal processors, uh, or even like stage monitor mixes. Um, usually there's two different ways of controlling these mixes. Uh, it, these uh, mixes can either be on a fader, like most digital consoles can have sends on faders, uh, or it can be on an, on a, an actual knob. Um, however, we can select whether this knob is pre or post the fader on that channel strip. Um, so if the, if the signal that's being sent from the aux, either fader or knob, is pre-fader, meaning if the fader uh, is, is down or up, it doesn't matter because it's pre the fader. So it, that's just the signal is going to make its way from the preamp to the aux section, and then we can just start turning it up from there. Uh, Pre-fader is pretty cool. Uh, it's where the channel's fader will not affect the send. It's usually used for headphone or monitor mixes. So this way, uh, like my front of house, can be I can use my main fader on the channel strip to go to my main uh, front of house. And then I can use my aux section to build the individual mixes for the performers. That way, as I change my mix for the front of house, it doesn't change the mix to the performer, which has already been established. Um, alternatively, we have post-fader. That's where the channel's fader will alter the, the sin's level. It's commonly used for effect mixes. That would be, let's say we're, we're turning up the aux fader or knob, uh, sending to, a, let's say, a reverb unit. And we'd want, we wouldn't want if I turned the, the, the main fader on that channel 
down for it to still allow that signal to make its way to that uh, reverb. So to avoid that, we do post fader, meaning every time I lower the volume of my fader, it's going to, in relation, lower the volume out of that aux output. So again, pre-fader for headphone mixes, performer mixes, uh, and then post fader for most effects. Um, and then we have to remember that as we increase the individual either faders or knobs on the aux section, there's still what they call the aux master. So that's going to be a separate knob or fader in the master section uh, that's going to allow you effectively just the same as our, our faders on the channels go to the master fader. Uh, all of our aux faders or knobs are going to go to an aux master fader or knob. That's just going to control the overall output. So we've got to make sure that's up in order for the aux sends uh, to work on the individual channel. Cool. So let's move on to buses. So on a typical channel strip, you know, we're going to make our way. We're going to plug the, the mic into the either the mic or the line. Of course, you know, if it's actually a microphone, probably going to go into the mic input. We're going to use a preamp to get our signal up to line level. It's going to make its way down in the EQ or be able to control the tone. Uh, it's going to make its way into the aux section where we can uh, split it off into separate mixes. It's going to make its way into the fader. And then with the buses, we're going to establish where does that signal go from that fader. Um, so a typical bus allows the fader signal to be transported to a separate output, allowing multiple signals to combine before outputting. When a signal's out, out, sorry, when the signal inputs into a console's channel, it must be assigned to a bus to be heard. Most commonly, stereo bus or left-right is used. Some consoles have multiple buses, allowing you to assign a channel to a variety of signal paths. So just like we talked about the main faders. Uh, are, are, are the, the faders on the on the strip that go to the main fader. In order to get them to that main fader, or that left-right fader, that stereo fader, whatever you want to call it, you have to engage its bus. So we'll talk about that here. So we talked about the preamp and the EQ section. Well, that preamp and EQ section bleeds down into, uh, this is still part of the channel strip, just a little further down the channel strip. Uh, within here, we've got our buses, our sends. Uh, Neve uh, calls them groups. Um, however, these groups are effectively, these are just which output do we want uh, this fader to be heard on? Because there's, there's a fader right below here. Um, and so where do we want this to be heard? So if we want it to be heard on the stereo bus, which is the bus that our speakers are listening to, that, you know, uh, effectively we're, what we're going to be blending our mix into, would be our stereo bus. So we'd have to engage that per channel that we want to bleed over into the main output. So if that bus is not selected, you will not it will not be heard on the main output. So again, if we want this channel to go to the main out, stereo out, we just engage the stereo group or bus. Um, however, uh, just to kind of, uh, just because I've got the picture here, these are pictures of the aux section of the Neve console. So again, these are the knobs that would be turned up, uh, would bleed to the aux master that is then turned up and you know can be heard on the output of the auxes. Um, and again, we've got that pre or post select. So that can each aux can be either pre or post. Cool. And then, of course, we talked about the faders. So that preamp section, that EQ section, that aux section, the bus, uh, those are all effectively right below that is going to be your fader. And the fader ultimately controls the send uh, or bus, or sorry, it controls the level being sent to a bus or a recorder. Uh, it can also act as the return from a monitor signal. So we can use it to monitor our Pro Tools signal, or we can use it to monitor signals that are being plugged into the console. And again, we do have to assign where the fader goes. So if we want the faders to come out, the main output, we would have to assign them to the bus, the main output bus. Cool. So that's the individual channels. Um, so now we've, we've got that established. Um, so then we talked about how those individual channels are going to be bussed out to the main fader. Well, the main fader is usually found, uh, just like the aux uh, main master fader, uh, within what we call the master section. 
The master section is going to include the master fader, where all individual sounds are summed to the two-channel left-right output. Uh, the outputs commonly feeds the speakers or any external two-track recorders. So if we're going to want to record our mix, that would be the mix we would record. Uh, the master aux section, uh, that's going to include our aux masters for sends. So again, that's just the overall output of the blended aux knobs. Um, Ultimately, so includes aux master for sends and as aux returns for line level signals not requiring a full channel strip. So these aux returns, effectively what those are, some consoles will have aux returns, which are effectively just additional inputs that don't have all of the fun stuff that we just talked about on the channel strip. They're literally just, usually just one knob for volume that bleeds automatically to the main output. Um, so they're, just, they're very simple. They're like for effects and things where you can use your auxes to blend to the aux master, the aux master to your effect, and then you can just output that effect back to an aux return, and then you just turn it up. So it just kind of just makes them simple. You could always take that uh, uh, signal, the process signal, and output to an individual channel if you did want to still hit the preamp, the EQ, you know, if you wanted to send divide that out to headphones or whatever you needed to do. Um, also within this uh, master section, you've got your main monitor knob. Uh, this is uh, not on all consoles, but uh, on nicer studio consoles. Effectively, it's just a, usually a nice big knob and it's the volume controls the overall listening uh, volume of the speakers. Um, so what that would do, you can keep your main fader at unity, meaning that you're, you're, you know exactly what your mix sounds like at unity output meaning your input is equal to your output. Um, however, uh, you don't want your speakers to have to always be full volume. Um, so you have a, a volume control just pretty much for the speakers that's after the main fader. So effectively, you still are listening to your mix at Unity, but you're controlling the volume of the speaker. Um, master section continued. Um, also, sometimes within the master section, you're going to find the mono button. Mono button's cool. It's just a simple way to engage to make sure that your left-right mix, if for whatever reason, if it ever did get some to mono, uh, you know, if it was coming out of, let's say, a mono television uh, or, uh, you know, if you take it to a club uh, and the club is, you know, all set up in mono because it's cheaper to do it that way and usually... You know, there's not the perfect left-right scenario at most clubs, so they just they just have signal coming out of a whole bunch of speakers and a whole lot of different places. And a lot of times it might not be stereo image. A lot of times maybe they might sum the stereo image to mono. Um, so we want to check mono because we've talked about this before. If we are not checking in mono, our mixes might we might lose our vocal if say the vocal is out of. Uh, you know, if the left and right, if there's any sort of phase issue, or it might be that you sum it to mono and all of a sudden your guitar part goes away. You know, so you want to always be checking in mono to make sure that your mixes sound good in mono as well. It might not be that they're always listening in mono, it might sound better in stereo, but you want to make sure that it at least sounds decent in mono as well. Um, there's also going to be the talkback button. Uh, this is used to communicate with musicians via headphones, studio speakers, or stage monitors. Uh, usually within nicer consoles, there'll be a microphone. You just engage the button uh, and it allows you to speak. Uh, you can select which output you want it to go out of. Do you want it to go out the auxes, maybe to hit the, you know, to the musician's headphones. And then we also have alternative monitors. It's used to change the playback speakers. On nicer consoles, sometimes you'll have more than uh, just one uh, set of speakers. Or in nicer studios, sometimes you have more than just one set of good speakers. Uh, so within the alternate monitors, you can select maybe speaker set A, speaker set B, speaker set C, and they could all be you know three different types of monitors. Just so you can you know be A being your mixes. So this is the master section of the uh, a Neve console again that we're going to have up in, in in our main control room at our new campus. Um, so within uh, this master section, we can find our, our VU meters. Uh, we've got our, our master uh, volume controller, the monitor level. So this again, this is post the fader. The fader lives down here, the master fader. Um, so this would be post the master fader or after the master fader. Um, here's our talk back section. So that can be where effectively we just we plug the mic in here. We turn the mic up. 
and then we say which output do we want that mic to go out of. Um, we've also got our speaker selection so we can listen to speaker set A, B, or C. Um, this is effectively additional input sources. So like if we wanted to listen to say the output of our recording device, instead of it taking up a whole channel, we can just plug that into an external input. It makes its way right to the big knob, turn it up and listen to it. Cool. Sweet. So let's move beyond uh, the mixing console into the patch bay. So a lot of times the patch bay and the mixing console, sometimes they're actually built together. Sometimes uh, the other one just kind of lives next to it. But effectively the patch bay is going to contain all of the inputs and outputs of most, if not all, of the equipment in the recording studio uh, and allows access and ability to redirect the signal flow. So that means we can take signal from, say, uh, we've got signal coming from a, a completely different room uh, via, let's say, a, a snake or something. That snake can make its in, or outputs uh, right on the patch bay to where we can then take a cable, plug it into the patch bay, uh, output the output of that microphone into the preamp, uh, you know, and we can select whichever preamp we want, you know, whichever channel we want to plug it into. Uh, effectively, it's just used for redirecting. It's also how we would, let's say, if we output something out of our aux uh, section, we can patch into that aux output and plug that into the input of our uh, signal processor. We can then take the output of that signal processor, plug it into either an aux return or back into its own channel. Um, so again, patch bay is just a way of redirecting your signal flow or just controlling it in the first place. Cool. So also uh, within uh, most consoles, you're going to find meters. There's two different types of meters. Uh, we want to go over both of those. Uh, VU meters. Uh, these are these fun fancy ones. The older style. You you've, you might have seen these around a while. That they aren't as common as they used to be. Uh, the VU stands for volume units. It's found on most analog gear and responds much slower than peak meters. Uh, it measures the average amount of voltage. So it's pretty cool. It's it's just kind of telling you an average. So it's not very you know like not extremely accurate. Um, but it does give you a good idea of what your signal looks like. Alternatively, we have our peak meter, uh, which is going to measure peak voltages, uh, making it essential for digital audio because it responds quickly to transients and ensures that no levels exceed that zero decibel mark. So we don't want to ever exceed the zero decibel mark within a digital console. Like we've talked about, if we exceed that, that zero uh, line with our with our signal, we're going to go above and we're not going to be able to fully capture what's going on up there. It'll be too loud for our device to convert it to digital. So it'll come across as, you know, popping and clicking and nasty sound. So we want to avoid that and we avoid that by making sure we're watching our meters and keeping that signal uh, low. So speaking of, so when we're setting those signals, we want to always be doing optimal what we call gain structuring. Um, gain structuring is uh, effectively where we're going to use the gain volume R preamp uh, to optimize the signal level at all paths. So whenever it comes into our channel strip, we want to optimize it. Whenever those channels combine to our master output, we want to again optimize it, you know, to make sure that we're not clipping at the, at the channel strip and we want to make sure that we aren't too far under at the channel strip. So an optimal level in digital is usually somewhere between negative 20 and negative 6 decibels full scale. So that's when we're looking at that meter, it's representing decibels full scale. So full scale being our maximum to our minimum. So we don't have to go all the way to the maximum. That used to be the old school of thought back in analog days because everything sounded best closer to that maximum. In fact, analog usually likes to be somewhere between negative 3 and plus 9. So that's why everyone kind of has that thought of let's get it as close to that zero line as possible. Well, nowadays we're in digital. Digital has much more headroom, uh, so we can take advantage of that. We don't have to get all the way to the tip top peak. Um, so for digital, we just need our signal to be somewhere between negative 20 and negative six. And that includes our main uh, output as well. Uh, so like whenever our, our signals combine, our main output meter, somewhere between again that negative uh, 20, negative 6, because uh, that's the signal that we can then send off to a mastering engineer uh, and then get that all the way, you know, to as close to that zero line as possible. Or even nowadays, you know, like Tidal, 
uh, that's doing, you know, streaming services sometimes are actually uh, mastering it negative nine, negative six sometimes. So if you go above that in your mixes, that means your mastering engineer has to has to actually just lower your volumes. It doesn't give you as much control. So, so of course, knowing where you ultimately want your mix to wind up, it's critical as well on optimizing those levels. And of course, we talked a lot about unity gain, but effectively, whenever we're talking about unity gain, that's where uh, if as a signal makes its way from, let's say, a, a channel strip to the main fader, if, or to the main output, main fader, on the channel strip itself, if our fader is at what we call unity, where the zero line, where we're not plus five, not negative five, just at the zero line, that's where our signal is neither amplified or attenuated at the fader. If I was to boost that fader a little bit, all of a sudden I've now increased the output of that channel strip. If I lower it, I'm decreasing the output of that channel strip. So again, at unity setting, that's where we know exactly what that preamp sounds like. Cool. I think that's it. Cool. Well, I do appreciate you guys and uh, do look forward to seeing y'all soon. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks again.